We are in a series that we've been calling Free For All, and we're studying the book of Galatians. And the reason we're calling this series Free For All is because the message of Galatians is Christian liberty and freedom. I'm thankful that we are not chained to the law, but that we can actually experience uh, spiritual freedom in Christ Jesus. I'm thankful for that. That's the message of Galatians. And uh, this is week number three uh, of our study in Galatians. And we're going to be in chapter number two today. Galatians chapter 2 and if you don't have a Bible there should be a Bible in the seat back in front of you I want to encourage you to grab that and you can use that uh, you can look it up uh, on your phone as well but I want to encourage you to have a Bible today we will refer back to these verses often the Bible says this in Galatians chapter 2 verse number 1 then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also and I went up by revelation, everybody say revelation. revelation, and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which are of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage to whom we have to whom we gave place by subjection no not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you verse number six but of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were and maketh no matter to me God accepteth no person no man's person for they who seemed to be somewhat in conference, added nothing to me. Added nothing to me. Today, I want to speak to this subject on Father's Day, real mature. Everybody look to your neighbor and say, real mature. Real mature. Let's have a word of prayer together. God, thank you so much for this day that you've given us. God, thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together and to worship you every Sunday on the Lord's Day. God, I pray that there would be great value in our time together as we study your word. I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, give me the words to say that would be uh, challenging for us today, encouraging and uh, edifying for us. God, I pray that we can understand what it means to live and to grow in spiritual maturity. And uh, God, I pray that you would use this uh, service and the one to come. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, how many of you have an older sibling? Can I see your hands? You have an older sibling. How many of you know, to, know how to get on your older sibling's nerves? Anybody like that? You know how to push their buttons? I remember growing up, I have uh, an older brother and two uh, older sisters. And I know exactly how to push their buttons just to kind of get under their skin uh, a little bit. I remember on road trips, I used to sit next to my sister, Christine, and I would just poke her. I just kept on poking, poking, poking. And when she would say, Matt, stop, I would say, freedom of the press, freedom of the press, freedom of the press, just to be irritating, just to bother her uh, as a younger sibling. How many of you know what I'm talking about as the younger sibling, right? My sister, Christine, she loved to play uh, board games and card games. Any board game people in here, you love to play board games and buy the rules. That, that's my sister, Christine. She knows all the rules and uh, she loves to play the game skip bow. And uh, she always is playing skip bow, and she knows all the rules, has the cards lined up perfectly. And growing up, if I ever felt like I was about to lose, I hate the feeling of losing. And so before giving her the satisfaction of winning the game, I would just take all the cards and throw them up into the air and completely mess up the game. And uh, she would get so irritated with me uh, when I would do that. Uh, it's safe to say that growing up, I was lacking some uh, maturity when it came to my siblings, right? I think... Tragically and sadly, what we are so often missing in our homes today, in our churches today, is a level of spiritual maturity. Where we are having churches that are content to just stay in the shallow end spiritually. And it becomes a very superficial type of faith. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be in malice be children when it comes to evil things, when it comes to sinful things. You can be uh, simple concerning that which is evil, but wise concerning that which is good. He says, but in understanding, 
be men. What, what is he saying? He, he's saying, hey, we ought to grow in our level of faith. We ought to grow in our understanding of scripture. We can't be content to just kind of stay over in the shallow, and we have to uh, grow in our understanding of the word of God. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul put it this way to the church at Ephesus in verse 11. He said, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so he says, these leaders in the church, this is their purpose, the, the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists. Here's the purpose for the perfecting, the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. Any perfect people in the room? Can I see? There's usually somebody that's like, oh, yeah, I'm perfect. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not perfect. And so what does this word mean? Uh, it's the Greek word teleos. The idea is a full-grown, mature adult. It's talking about someone that's full-grown. So spiritually, till we can find ourselves in a place of maturity unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the way, how many of you know that in today's culture, there's a lot of different winds of doctrine that are being infiltrated into our culture? And so often, because of a lack of spiritual maturity, we're getting blown away by all the different winds of doctrine. But Paul says, and by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, it's my heart for the church that we would grow in spiritual maturity. And as followers of Jesus today, we have to understand that God has called us to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and to uh, have the ability to, to grow in our theological discourse and to even grow in our way that we handle uh, disputes and disagreements within the church. How many of you know that there's so much division that takes place in the church simply because there is spiritual immaturity? We haven't learned the ability to come together and to work together and to show grace. And there's so often spiritual immaturity that is just running rampant uh, in the church and in the world today. By the way, spiritual maturity is not contingent upon age. It's not about just how old you are. How many of you know uh, that it's been rightly said that you can grow old without growing up? Uh, the Bible says this in Psalm 100, verse number 99. I have more understanding than all of my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients. That's a polite way of saying older people. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. And so wisdom is not about what age you have. Wisdom is about how much you are diving into the word of God and how much scripture you know and how much uh, time you are investing, growing in uh, the words of God. God. And so today the question that I have for us is simply this. Are you growing and advancing in spiritual maturity? Are you advancing in spiritual maturity? Now, to answer that question today, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And uh, we find in this passage uh, a very paramount and important section of scripture dealing with the doctrine of salvation. And Paul is writing to the Galatians, and he's confronting and addressing an issue that was uh, a common problem in, in the day. And I want you to notice in verse number one, we're going to dive into this text. Everybody ready today? Notice verse number one. It says this. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And so uh, we have to understand, uh, before we can really unpack what Paul's saying here in Galatians, we have to understand a little bit of the backstory. So would it be okay today if we understood a little bit of the context of Galatians chapter 2? And uh, Paul and Barnabas, uh, they were great friends. Barnabas' name means the son of encouragement. Uh, Barnabas was an encourager. And Barnabas and Paul, they went out on this first missionary journey together. Uh, they went out, they left from the church at Antioch. And they went out, you can read about it in Acts chapter 13 and 14, and they were preaching the gospel message and some great things were happening. In fact, uh, what was so great about this first missionary journey is that the gospel was being spread to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. Now that was an amazing thing because if you're not Jewish today, you're a Gentile, that means the gospel has come to us. Aren't you thankful that we have had the gospel come to us? And so Paul and Barnabas, they go out on this missionary journey. They come back and they give this report to the church at Antioch. And uh, how many of you have ever been a part of a 
church service where a missionary comes back and they give like a slideshow. They give an update, right? That old school projector sometimes that would uh, come up on the screen. They show some pictures, right? That's Paul and Barnabas. They come back. They're like, hey, we want to give you this report from our missionary journey. It was awesome. Uh, this was their report in Acts 14, 27. And they were come, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, so they got everybody together. Hey, we've got some stories to tell. This was awesome. They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how that he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Okay, this is significant. The gospel is now being spread to the Gentiles, and so they're giving this missionary report, and everyone was happy. Wow, that's amazing. The gospel, that's great. Uh, God's using you, Paul, and God's using you, uh, Barnabas. This is great. But when people heard that part, that the Gentiles were being saved, then the tone changed a little bit. There were some uh, Jewish legalists, the Judaizers, they all of a sudden heard that part. Wait, wait a second, the Gentiles are being saved? They didn't, they didn't like that part because they thought that the gospel and the good news was just for them. And so what they said was, if a Gentile wants to be saved, he has to become Jewish in order to receive that salvation. And so before a Gentile can be saved, they have to uh, make this uh, transition. They have to become Jewish. And so this caused a pretty heated argument amongst the church leaders. This led to a uh, church council meeting coming together and a church conference meeting coming together in Jerusalem. And the Bible says this in Acts 15, verse number 1. Everybody tracking with me this morning? Laying some groundwork before we get into our, our text today. Acts 15, 1, they have this meeting, okay? And it says this. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, this is what they were teaching, and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot, everybody say cannot, yeah. you cannot be saved. You can't be saved. Now, typically in church, when you start reading verses on circumcision, especially on a Sunday morning, it kind of reminds me of this meme up here. I think we have it this morning, this next picture. Well, this is awkward, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and head out now, right? Like sometimes we kind of get uncomfortable. What is this talking about? Well, we have to understand the Old Testament, uh, this sign of circumcision was a sign between uh, God and his covenant people, uh, the Jewish people. By the time you get to the New Testament, this covenant sign was no longer necessary. But what the Judaizers were saying is, hey, if you want to be saved, you have to adhere to the law of Moses. You have to be circumcised. You have to do these things in order to be saved. And Paul and Barnabas were saying, absolutely not. That's not the gospel message. The gospel is not of works that we can do. It's all about God's grace. This was the message that Paul was passionate, passionately declaring. Now, in Acts 15, verse number 2, it says this, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. So this was a big deal. They had this big meeting. They came together, and uh, uh, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other men should go up to Jerusalem and unto the apostles and elders about this question. And so they said, okay, Paul and Barnabas, if you're so serious about this, about grace and not adhering to the law of Moses, then you need to go and talk to the church leaders that are at Jerusalem. And so that's exactly what Paul and Barnabas did. They packed their bags, they bought their tickets, they rented a car, they booked a hotel. They said, we're going to this conference and we're going to talk about this issue and we're going to settle it once and for all. And so Galatians chapter 2 is Paul giving his summary of that meeting. Okay, everybody tracking with me? And so they go, they have the meeting in Acts 15 at Jerusalem, Galatians 2. Paul is saying this is what happened at that uh, profound and pinnacle and important meeting. Uh, growing up, I was a Dodgers fan, and uh, my dad always took us to Dodgers games. Any Dodgers fans in here this morning? And uh, we would go to Dodgers games, and, and uh, my favorite players were Eric Carrows and Mike Piazza, and uh, uh, back in the good old days, right? And uh, I remember love, I loved watching the Dodgers. And there was one pitcher, I have his baseball card, his name was Oral Hershiser. Has anybody heard of Oral Hershiser before, right? And uh, he is, I think we have a picture this morning, and uh, he was a great pitcher for the Dodgers. And early on in Oral Hershiser's career, he wasn't living up to his potential, and he wasn't working very hard. And so uh, the manager for the Dodgers, Tommy Lasorda, he went and he had a meeting on the mound with Oral Hershiser, and he basically confronted him, and he basically rebuked him and said, you're not working hard enough. You need to live up to your uh, potential by putting more hours in. And uh, later on, Oral Hershiser called that meeting the Sermon on the Mound. And he said that was a profound meeting. And uh, the Dodgers went on to win the World Series, and, and uh, 
Oral Hershiser won the Cy Young Award, and he went on to be an incredible pitcher, and he points his success back to that profound meeting on the mound. And I want you to know that Acts chapter 15 and Galatians chapter 2 is Paul's profound meeting on the mound. And uh, this was a profound meeting that was a turning point for the gospel message that the gospel could be could be declared and and the gospel could move forward among the Gentile people. And so this is a very significant moment as we'll see as we unpack these verses. So now that we have a little bit of the context of what's going on in Galatians chapter 2, are you ready to dive into this chapter together today? All right. Uh, There are four indications from this passage that you are growing and advancing in spiritual maturity. Four indications. Number one is this. You strive for cooperation. You strive for cooperation. Now, I love that Paul had this desire to work together with the Jerusalem church. He wanted to go and uh, he wanted to meet with these leaders because he wanted to get on the same page. Uh, Paul did not have this rogue mindset that says, I don't care what they're teaching over there. I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do. And I'm just, it doesn't matter what they do over there. Paul's heart was to work together. He had a heart for cooperation. Now, uh, this involves two things as we look to our text. First, it involves revelation. Everybody say revelation. revelation. Notice verse number two of Galatians chapter 2. It says this, and I went up, this is Paul speaking, he's talking about his trip to Jerusalem for this meeting. He says, I went up by, what does it say? Revelation. He says, I went up by revelation. And that's important because that tells us that Paul went up uh, by direction from God, by revelation. We don't know what manner of revelation this was. We don't know if it was God speaking to him audibly or if Paul had a dream or if he had a vision. But what we do know is that Paul went up by revelation from God. And I believe that this is significant because Paul was not just going to Jerusalem because he felt like it. Paul wasn't just going to Jerusalem because he wanted to uh, stir the pot. He wasn't just going to Jerusalem because he wanted to make a name for himself or because he had ulterior motives. Paul went up to Jerusalem because that's exactly what God wanted him to do. And sometimes we can think, well, man, I wish God would tell me exactly what to do. Can I tell you? He has. See, we might not have a dream today, but I want to tell you we have something far better. We have the written, perfect, inspired, infallible word of God. This is God's word revealed to us. And if you are looking for direction in life, look no further than the revelation of God's word. So often today we are looking for direction and we are seeking for answers and we're trying to find it in all of the wrong places. But I want to tell you that there are principles in the Bible that can set the trajectory for your entire life. You say, well, the Bible doesn't tell me uh, who I'm supposed to marry or the Bible doesn't tell me exactly where I'm supposed to work or what job I'm supposed to have. But there are biblical principles that will set you in the right direction that you can follow his word and walk in his way. And so we see uh, Paul, he went up by revelation. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Romans 15, 4 says, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that through patience and comfort through the scriptures, we might have hope. And I just want to encourage you today. If you have a big decision coming up in your life, if you are contemplating your future, if you are making plans, make sure that your plans are not rooted in preference. Make sure that your plans are not rooted in convenience. Make sure that your plans are rooted deep in the revelation of God's word and the direction you are headed is based on what God's word says. This is Paul. He, he said, I'm going to go up by revelation. But then I want you to see the communication. He says this in verse 2. And I went up, I went to Jerusalem because of the revelation, and then he says, and communicated. He communicated. And so there was revelation, then there was communication. He says, communicated unto them the gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation. That means the people that were uh, leading uh, the church, the leaders, the, the, uh, the big names, so to speak. Paul said, I went and privately, by the way, uh, that's an example of spiritual maturity as well. He said, I'm not going to put this out on blast in front of everybody. Hey, let's go talk about this privately amongst church leadership. And uh, there's an idea that would cause a, lot of, uh, 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 cause a lot less drama in the church and dissension if we just went to the church leaders and say, hey, I want to talk about something. And so he goes to the leaders, and and then he says this, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Now, Paul was not doubting his message. 
Uh, he, he wasn't saying, man, I don't know if I'm just wasting my time. What he didn't want was the Jerusalem church leaders to be preaching a different message than Paul was preaching and hinder the truth of the gospel. And so Paul says, I'm going to go and I'm going to work well uh, with these leaders. We're going to communicate and cooperate together. I love that Paul was striving for cooperation. Imagine if Paul didn't. Imagine if Paul didn't strive for cooperation. The church in the first century would have been most likely exclusively Jewish. There would have been a mixture of law and grace. They would have been trapped in the chains of legalism. But I'm thankful that Paul had the courage and the wherewithal and the spiritual maturity to say, hey, we need to go and we need to work this out. We need to see what God said and strive in cooperation. Can I tell you that God can use a church to do some great things when we strive for cooperation. When we say, hey, we're going to work together and we're going to strive together for the faith of the gospel. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace endeavoring to keep that spirit of unity. Now, we're not talking about compromising truth. We're not talking about sacrificing doctrine, right? J.C. Ryle said this, unity without the gospel is worthless unity. It is the very unity of hell. And so we're not talking about just kind of sacrificing our beliefs and kind of just holding hands with everyone and singing kumbaya by the fireplace and, and just kind of not caring about what we believe. But we are talking about being united under the name of Jesus, under the banner of Jesus, and striving together for the faith of the gospel. Can I tell you there is no telling how God can use Rock Hill Church if we decide that we are going to work together for the faith of the gospel. Hey, there's no telling how many people can be reached and how many lives can be changed if we would say, you know what, we're going to serve together. We're going to serve in harmony and in unity because where there is spiritual maturity there will be relational harmony when you are walking in maturity you will be walking in harmony and Paul said hey I want to strive for cooperation I want to come together and work this out because we've got to do this together Corey Ten Boom said this be united with other Christians a wall with loose bricks is not good the bricks must be cemented together this has got to be the picture of the church. And so what we see is Paul was striving for cooperation. And when you are walking in spiritual maturity, you will strive for cooperation. Here's the second indication that you are growing in spiritual maturity. Number two is this. You stand against opposition. You stand against opposition. Alexander Hamilton famously said that if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And what we are seeing in our culture today is people are taking a stand. The culture is taking a stand, but often the church is remaining silent. I remember several years ago, I was leading a public school, um, middle, uh, middle school uh, uh, Christian club, and I went to this middle school, and we were teaching this Christian club, and there was a big banner on the, in the hallway of that school, and the banner said, what do you stand for, question mark. And then all the middle schoolers were coming in, they were signing all the things that they were standing for. And so I thought that was interesting. So I went over and I wanted to see what the fifth and sixth graders were standing for. And uh, some of the things that they were standing for were kind of generic. You know, I'm standing for peace. I'm standing for love. But then I started to, to read more of those signatures. And some of the most common and repetitive things on that banner were, I'm going to stand for gay marriage. I'm going to stand for abortion. I'm going to stand for these issues. And I thought about that, and I thought in fifth and sixth grade, I'm not sure that they even completely understand what these issues are. But they're taking a stand for it. And we have to recognize that people in culture today, they're taking a stand for these things. And God has called us to take a stand against opposition and to take a stand for truth. Now, it doesn't mean that we have a right to be mean about it. It doesn't mean that we have a right to not be gracious. Some people, they take a stand. They take the right stand with the wrong spirit right? Some people have the right spirit, but the wrong stand. I believe that we ought to have the right spirit and the right stand, and we ought to stand for the truth of God's word. And what we see in this passage is Paul is taking a stand for what's right. He's taking a stand against opposition. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13 says this, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. That's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus, stand for truth. Now, to do that, it's going to take wisdom. I want you to see it in verse 3. It says this, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. 
And so what Paul is telling the churches at Galatia, who had fallen back into the traps of legalism, he said, when I went to that Jerusalem council, when we went to that meeting, Titus was there. He was a Gentile. And they did not tell Titus that he needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. And so Titus was a living, breathing example of the grace of God. He didn't have to adhere to the law of Moses in order to be saved. That's the point that Paul is making. Now, notice verse number four. Everybody still with me today? Anybody else with me today? Verse 4, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that freedom that we have. Uh, they came in to spy it out, that they might bring us into bondage. And so Paul said, while we're there at that meeting, there were some Judaizers that came in, some people that said you had to uh, follow the law of Moses in order to be saved. And they were spying on that meeting, and they were uh, being kind of sneaky in that meeting. And Paul had the wisdom and the wherewithal to spot out those wolves in sheep's clothing. Can I tell you today that that is exactly what we need from God? Wisdom to be able to identify the lies of the enemy. Wisdom to be able to identify the lies and the deception that are coming from culture today. Hey, we can't just have an open mindset and an unfiltered uh, mind that just says, hey, whatever, come on in. No, we have to keep our heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And what Paul had was some wisdom to identify the lies uh, that were being brought in. And so Paul had this this wisdom uh, that was taking place. The Bible says in Colossians 2.8, beware. Everybody say beware. beware. Beware lest any man spoil you. The word spoil is a very strong word in the original language. It carries some connotations of destruction. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And so he was saying, beware, remain on guard to stand against opposition. Now, it's going to take wisdom, but it's also going to take courage. Notice verse 5. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. What was Paul saying here? We did not even entertain that idea. Not even for an hour did we entertain this idea of a false gospel coming in. By the way, you can sense all throughout the letter of Galatians that Paul was fired up because he was standing for truth. And today, I believe in the church, what we're doing is we're taking a back seat when we ought to take a front seat and be fired up for the truth of the gospel and to know what we stand for. And Paul said, I'm going to stand for the truth of the gospel. And so when they come in, they're trying to spy this out. We're not even going to entertain this false ideology, this false philosophy, this false religion. No, not even for an hour. By the way, I believe that people today, deep down, they really are searching for truth. I believe people deep down really do want to know what the truth is. There's, there's a British pastor that he recently said this, uh, Rico Tice. He said, there is increasing hostility to the gospel message. But there's something else going on, too. There's also increased hunger. The same rising tide of secularism and materialism that rejects truth claims and, it's, and is offended by absolute moral standards is proving to be an empty and hollow way to live. You're more and more likely to find people quietly hungering for the content of the gospel, even as our culture teaches them to be hostile towards it. Can I tell you that there are people in the city of Rancho Cucamonga that are searching for truth. There are people in the Inland Empire that are hungering after church and after truth. And as the church, we are the pillar and the ground of the truth. And we ought to go and boldly declare the gospel message and stand against opposition. If we're not going to do it, who's going to do it? And so Paul was standing against the opposition. Notice verse number six. In verse five, he says, I didn't entertain it, not even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might, be, might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat. Now, now, now Paul is talking about, uh, again, those of reputation. He's, he's kind of talking about the celebrity status amongst, amongst church leaders. He said, those that seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, make no uh, matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. God is not a respecter of persons. Uh, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. And what he was saying is they added nothing to me. They added nothing to his message. They approved of his message. They said, hey, we're not going to add to the gospel. You're right on, Paul. Keep preaching that message. But Paul here uh, is saying, hey, uh, I'm not trying. Paul was not being disrespectful. Um, the whole reason he went to Jerusalem was to have uh, respect and to work together and to strive together. But what Paul was saying is I'm not enamored with celebrity culture. Paul was saying, I'm not uh, trying to find what is popular 
I'm not trying to be impressed by, by status or significance or what is attractive or fashionable or who is famous, those, to be, those that seem to be somewhat. See, God is not looking for who is famous. God is looking for who is faithful. And, and Paul said, uh, 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 there is uh, these people here and, and, uh, and uh, makes no difference to me. God is not a respecter of persons. The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6. Most men will, pro- will, will proclaim everyone his own goodness but a faithful man who can find. How true is that verse in 2021? Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Have you looked at Instagram lately? Everyone will proclaim their own goodness. Everyone's going to post their own uh, success stories and their own uh, things that make them look great. But then he says, but a faithful man who can find. God's looking for faithfulness. Blaise Pascal was a 15th century theologian. He said, knowing God without knowing our own wretchedness makes for pride. Knowing our own wretchedness without knowing God makes for despair. But knowing Jesus Christ strikes the balance because he shows us both God and our own wretchedness. And this is the balance that we ought to uh, strive. I'm not looking to impress people. I'm looking to make an impact for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this was, uh, Paul, you strive for cooperation. You stand against opposition. Here's the third indication that you're growing in spiritual maturity. Number three is this. You recognize your unique calling. You recognize your unique calling. Now, I want you to see what Paul says here in verse number seven. Everybody with me? Verse seven says this. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, the Gentiles, was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision, the Jews, was committed unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the Jews, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Here, here's all that Paul is saying. You might think, what does this have to do with me? And what's going on here in this passage? Paul was saying that God gave me a unique ministry to uh, the Gentiles. God gave uh, Peter a unique ministry to uh, the Jews. And uh, they were preaching the same gospel, the same Lord, the same salvation, but in different contexts. And this is what Peter was saying. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, he said something similar. He said, Whitfield and Wesley, they might preach the gospel better than I do, but they cannot preach a better gospel. And so what Paul is saying is, hey, God has called us in unique contexts, in, in unique areas to uh, proclaim the gospel message. And Jews were being saved and Gentiles were being saved and they were often coming together. Now, this was astounding in the first century because, you know, today what, what's very uh, common and prevalent and it's talked about often is the problem of racism and the evil of racism. But what we have to understand is that uh, racism in the first century was just as prominent and even much more prominent because the Jews and the Gentiles hated each other. There was great uh, racial tension. They didn't even want to speak to one another. But now because of the gospel, they're actually coming together. Now because the Jews and the Gentiles are are hearing about the life-giving and the life-changing message of Jesus, they are experiencing forgiveness and they are united under the banner of Jesus Christ and so where there was once great hostility now there is reconciliation can I tell you that the hope for reconciliation today in our culture is still the gospel message it's still Jesus Christ it's still the forgiveness of sins it's still the blood that was shed for you and for me that's the hope for reconciliation the Bible says in Ephesians 2 13 but now in Christ Jesus ye who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ for he is our peace who hath made us both one. What is he talking about here? The Jews and the Gentiles and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And so because of the cross, reconciliation is made possible. And so here's what I want you to see. Peter and Paul were serving in their unique calling. Paul was serving and reaching the Gentiles and Peter was reaching the Jews. And, uh, and uh, by the way, uh, that didn't mean that they never uh, reached uh, to the opposite. Paul sometimes, when he would go to a city, he would go straight to the Jewish synagogue and uh, he would preach there. Uh, Peter opened up his home and met with uh, in, in the home of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. And so uh, they were preaching uh, the same Lord, the same gospel, but in different contexts, just like a missionary would today. Uh, I've had the privilege to go and uh, preach in many different countries. And uh, in different countries, they have a lot of different cultures, right? And uh, in Korea, they don't shake hands, they bow. And I kind of wish we did that here because I think that's great. I would love to just bow every time I wanted to greet someone, right? And uh, uh, different cultures. Hey, a Bible study in China looks a lot different than a Bible study here. But through these different churches, much different cultures, you know what remains the same? 
the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It remains the same. And so Paul and Peter were understanding their unique calling. Can I tell you that God has given you a unique calling calling and a unique circle of influence for you to reach people with the life-giving and life-changing message of Jesus? And I would encourage you to find your calling and to run in that lane. Maybe it's kids ministry. Maybe it's youth ministry. Uh, maybe it's serving in one area. Uh, maybe it's prison ministry. Hey, whatever ministry that might be, to find that and to serve in that capacity for God's glory. The Bible says this in 1 Peter 4.10, as every man, everybody say every man, every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And so as God has gifted all of us, every man, we're to take that gifting, that spiritual gift, and to go and to deploy it for the sake of the gospel. And this is what Peter and, and Paul were doing. Now, notice verse number nine. It says, and when James and Cephas, that was Peter, James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, okay, so they were like the big three, you know, when, when uh, LeBron James first went over to Miami several years ago, it was LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh, right? They were the big three. Well, here Peter says, James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, he says they were the big three. And uh, they perceived the grace that was given unto me, and they gave me Barnabas and the right hands of fellowship. They had a hearty handshake, and uh, we should go into the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. And so what was Paul saying? Hey, we agreed. We came, we got on the same page. And Paul and Barnabas and Titus, they went and they were preaching to the Gentiles. And Peter, James, and John, they went and they were preaching to the Jews, serving in their unique calling. And there's one more indication that I want us to see today that you're growing in spiritual maturity. Do you have one more in you today? Here's the fourth indication. You consider those that are less fortunate than you. When you are growing in spiritual maturity, it's not all about you. It's about those that are less fortunate than you. It's about loving others and reaching others. And I find that this passage concludes in verse number 10 in an interesting way. It says this in verse 10. He said, they didn't add anything to our message. They approved of it. Only they would that we should remember the poor. He said, they didn't add anything to the message of salvation. But you want to know the one thing they encouraged us with? Don't neglect the poor. Don't neglect people that are in need. The same which I also was forward to do. Paul said, and I had a heart to do that. I wanted to consider those that were less fortunate than me. Uh, time and time again throughout scripture, we are commanded and instructed to demonstrate compassion to those that are less fortunate. The Bible says this in James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. This is pure, true religion, that you're going to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. In other words, someone that can never do anything to pay you in return, that's who you're going to go and serve. Those that are less fortunate than you. Now, to do this, as we close today, I want to show us that it takes two things. First, it's going to take awareness. Everybody say awareness. awareness. If we're not careful, we will develop a skewed perspective when it comes to helping the poor and those in need. John chapter 12, verse number five says this. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? This was the story when Mary uh, broke open the alabaster box and she was anointing the feet of Jesus. How many of you know what I'm talking about, this story? And uh, she was serving and, and she broke open this very expensive box of ointment, serving Jesus. And then who speaks up? Judas. Judas speaks up and he sounds very religious and he says, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? What is she doing, Jesus? There's so many people that are in need, and how could she give you such a lavish gift? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he had the bag, he was the treasurer, and he bare what was put therein. And so from an hour perspective, it looked like Judas really cared about the poor, right? Man, he's, Wow. Why did we do this? And should we have given this to the poor? It, it seemed like he really cared about other people. But then we learned that he really only cared about himself. Look at what Jesus says in response in John 12, verse 7. He said, then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. See, because of the effects of sin in a fallen nature, we're always going to have people that are struggling. Jesus said there's always going to be the poor. There's always going to be suffering. Now, that doesn't mean we turn a blind eye to it. 
But what it means and what we have to recognize is that the most loving thing that you can give someone is not a physical gift. The most loving thing that you can give someone is the gospel message. And so we want to give and we want to sacrifice and we want to help those in need. But we have to remember that while we're doing that, what they need the most is the gospel. That's why I love, you know, before COVID, our church was really involved in the God's Pantry ministry. I know Hilda uh, was there almost every single week and people from our church going to God's Pantry where we would uh, serve those in need and give groceries to those in need. Uh, But I love, what I loved about God's Pantry is not only were we giving groceries to those in need, we were praying with every single person that went through the line. We were sharing the gospel with every person that went through. We were giving a gospel invitation because the greatest need is salvation. The greatest need is the forgiveness of sins. And so Paul said, they told us to consider those that are less fortunate than us. It requires awareness, but it also requires action. He says at the end of verse number 10, the same which I also was forward to do. Paul said, my actions and my words are in alignment. He said, "I, I wanted to do this. Paul had a heart to help people. The Bible says in Romans 15, verse 25, but now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. See, when Paul was in uh, the region of Macedonia, he received an offering to give to the church at Jerusalem that was struggling. Uh, Those that were struggling in a famine, they said, hey, let's sacrificially give to help those that are in need. Paul had a heart to do this. In those churches, in Macedonia. Paul talks about them in 2 Corinthians 9, in verse 6, and he says this, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. And what we see from the churches of Macedonia is they had a heart to give. They had a heart of generosity. They wanted to sacrifice. They wanted to serve. They were considering those that were less fortunate than them. And today I believe that that's exactly what God has called us to do as a church. And on the back of our offering envelopes, and Daniel said earlier today, Uh, We always make an emphasis to say, if this is your first or second time, we don't plan the offering with with you in mind. The service is our gift to you. But when we do find a home, a church home, and we have experienced the life-giving and life-changing message of Jesus, we understand that God has called us to live a generous life. That's what God has called us to. On the back of these envelopes, it says that verse that I just read. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And as a church, we want to be wise with our resources for the glory of God to help more people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And I wanted to take a second as we close today, I wanted to talk about this envelope because it's been a while since we've, we've uh, talked about this. At the top portion, it says tithe. The word tithe, tithe simply means 10th. It means trusting God with uh, the first fruits, with, with 10% of our income. Hey, God is the owner of it all. He owns 100% but he has called us to be a good steward. And and we believe in the principle of the tithe to say, you know what, God owns it all, but I'm gonna honor him and I'm gonna trust him with the first 10. And if you've never trusted God with the tithe, I would encourage you to put God to the test. That's what Malachi says, to trust God, to prove him. And you can trust God with the tithe. The second category says missions. I'm thankful that as a young church, we are already supporting several different missionaries. And everything that comes through into the missions account, it goes directly out to our missionaries. And I'm thankful that we have missionaries in the Philippines and in Costa Rica and in Mexico. And uh, uh, we just sent a special offering to a missionary in Thailand. Hey, we want to be a missions-minded church. And we want to remember that, that, that there is gospel opportunity that is taking place here, but also around the world. But we aren't going to be able to give to other churches around the world if we are not strong and healthy here locally. And so we, we start with the tithe, then there's missions. Then uh, I love this next category, the building fund. And I'm so thankful for this building, and I'm so thankful that God has provided this space for us to lease. But I want you to know that this is a temporary place, and I believe that God is going to provide for us a permanent building and a place that we can buy and own. Come on, does anybody believe today that God wants us to get into our own building and that we can have our own space to worship God 
to make, an, make a difference and to make an impact in the, in the empire. And so I'm so thankful that there are those in our church that every week give above and beyond the tithe and missions to our building funds so that we can have uh, our own building one day. And we're saving that and preparing for the place that, that God has for us. And then this last category says gaining ground. And uh, if you were here over the last several months, we talked about that gaining ground. The gaining ground is our campaign that we're still in that helps us in this space. Uh, before this space, uh, if you were with us, you know our story. We just rented from uh, 10, 11, 12 different locations. And we met at City Hall. We met at uh, middle schools. We met at uh, community centers. And uh, when we got into this location, this was our first time to have uh, a building 24-7. And we are leasing this space, and we're so thankful for it. But uh, the expenses went way up, right? And uh, in the summer, uh, the air conditioning running and uh, the electricity goes way up, right? And uh, so what we said was, hey, we are gaining ground as a church. We're not going to uh, move backwards and lose some ground because of COVID. We're actually going to take some steps forward and we're going to move into a more permanent facility and we're going to gain ground. And so this fund, Gaining Ground, is all about uh, us helping that deficit in this building and in this space. And see, what is this all about? Ultimately, this is all about considering those that are less fortunate than us. I'm thankful today that you have a seat. But what about all the people in our community that don't have a seat? That still need to hear about the life-giving, life-changing message of Jesus. And I don't want to scare our dream team, but we have two services right now. And hey, don't be surprised if we're going to have three services. We might have to have four services. Hey, if God keeps blessing and God keeps growing, we're going to do whatever it takes to reach people with the gospel message. And we're going to keep on moving forward. And we're going to keep on considering those that are less fortunate than us. Because it's not about us. It's all about the glory of God and those that need the gospel message. And if we are growing in spiritual maturity, we're going to consider those that are less fortunate than us. I'm going to read one more verse today and we'll be done. And I want to invite you to join me in standing as I read this verse. The whole issue in Galatians 2, Paul was saying, hey, it's not about circumcision. Uh, it's not about the law. It's about the grace of God. This is what they determined in that Jerusalem meeting. And the Bible says this, the last verses I want to read, Acts chapter 4, verse number 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Aren't you thankful for the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That God raised, is anybody thankful for the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That God raised him from the dead. And that because Jesus is alive and because Jesus resurrected, we can as well. And that resurrection set the precedent raised him from the dead. Even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Jesus becomes the cornerstone. That stone that you rejected, that the builders refused and rejected, that rejected stone became the selected stone and became the resurrected stone and the cornerstone of our faith. He says, this is the cornerstone. And then he says this, neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Jesus Christ. It's not the law. It's not being a good person. It's not being religious. It's only through the grace of God by the name of Jesus Christ that you can be saved. And today, if you're in the room, if you're watching online and you don't know that you're saved, if you don't know that you have a home in heaven, today can be the day of salvation for you. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning.